uh, really uh, a joy to have these three folks with us today. Um, we've got Cynthia Mitchell, Marnie Thompson, and Aaron Tanaka here to talk about displacing injustice and embracing community, um, to talk about uh, thinking globally and acting locally, to talk about building a new economy starting where we live. Um, Marnie is a co-managing director of the Fund for Democratic Communities in Greensboro, North Carolina. Uh, she works with Ed Whitfield, who some of you may have heard you know, at the Common Bound Conference. Uh, in her work for, at F4DC, Marnie's focused on building the capacity of social justice activists and organizations, spreading the gospel of grassroots fundraising, and building a new kind of economy based in principles of cooperation and sustainability. Um, F4DC was just involved in the Co-op Econ Conference in Epps, Alabama, and you can read the beautiful dedication that Ed wrote for that in Yes Magazine uh, that was published this week. Uh, and Marnie's been closely involved in the Renaissance Community Co-op uh, which there will be a piece about that going up in Yes Today. Um, a really amazing project. It's a community-owned grocery store in Greensboro, North Carolina that uh, I'm sure Marnie will want to tell you all about in a little bit. Um, we also have Stacy Mitchell with us. Uh, Stacy is a senior researcher and co-director at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. Uh, she's based up in Portland, Maine. Uh, she runs their Community Scaled Economy Initiative, which produces research and analysis and partners with a whole range of allies to design and implement policies that curb economic consolidation and strengthen community-rooted enterprises. Um, she's written extensively on the retail and banking sectors. Uh, she has a fantastic TED Talk out there that I encourage people to watch, uh, and is also the author of Big Box Swindle, The True Cost of Mega Retailers, and The Fight for America's Independent Businesses, which was one of the first books uh, to really raise the alarm on, on uh, the issues with places like Walmart coming into cities and, and what that does to the local economy. Um, she's written for Business Week, Salon, The Nation, Grist, Sojourners, and many other publications, and uh, is doing some really incredible work right now, working with a whole network of folks, including organizations that she, local business organizations she's been with for a very long time, um, working to develop a localist policy agenda. Really, really exciting stuff. Um, and we've got a terrific moderator as well, and Aaron Tanaka, um, who's a Boston-based community organizer and impact investor, uh, founding executive director of the Boston Workers Alliance, where he's helped to organize no and low-income workers of color into one of Boston's leading grassroots economic justice organizations. Aaron also helped start the Boston Impact Initiative, an impact investment fund making value-driven loans and equity investments to grow the new economy since 2012. Uh, he's also led the formation of the Center for Economic Democracy, which is an emerging movement intermediary, uh, building grassroots capacity to lead transformative policy campaigns and new economy initiatives. Uh, I should also say that Aaron is on the board of the New Economy Coalition. Um, and Aaron, I will uh, turn my video off and let you lead this uh, really exciting conversation with these wonderful folks. Sounds great. Thanks, Mike. Well, it's a uh... A uh, pleasure to be here with you all today, um, particularly to be talking with Marnie and Stacy, both um, really brilliant and powerful women who are doing uh, amazing work in the field. Um, so I'm really excited about our conversation, and I think we have a lot to learn from uh, both of you. I just want to spend a little bit of time uh, just sharing a little bit of where I'm coming from and try to frame some of the conversation, and then it uh, won't take too long so that we can jump into hearing from you guys directly. Um, but as Mike mentioned, uh, again, my name is Aaron. I'm uh, from Boston over here in the Bay Area at the moment. Um, and a lot of the work that I've been doing recently is uh, really trying to think about how we can help uh, the grassroots organizing sector in Boston um, grow its power and analysis to really move, um, to strengthen the, the typical and the traditional organizing work that we've been doing, fighting for better standards and access uh, but also to be really thinking about what the transformation of the economy could look like. And a lot of that has to do with uh, really looking at how we can build new institutions that model uh, and prefigure the democratic future and sustainable future that we want to live in. Uh, and also thinking about policy strategies that um, allow us to move out of having to fight the same issues over and over and really change the rules of the game so that people can make decisions uh, instead of having to fight on, on a day-to-day -day basis as we are uh, all continue to do and need to continue to do. 
Uh, so a lot of our, our work here in Boston is trying to demonstrate uh, what could be happening situating local work uh, within a global context. And so from that standpoint, it's just really exciting uh, to be here with both of you. Um, so yes, as uh, I guess what, where I wanted to start was just sort of framing out some, some of the bigger picture questions and really situa situating it in a way that um, would allow you to both talk about some of the concrete ways that you're doing work uh, in your local communities. Um, but before we sort of move to that, I just want to kind of acknowledge the big picture uh, crisis that I think that we as a movement um, are acknowledging and dealing with. Um, you know, I was uh, very pleased to be in New York a few weeks ago at the Pe People's Climate Change March and I think uh, that was a pivotal moment hopefully in the climate justice movement that is um, uh, first of all just rejecting the the pseudoscience that's out there, the marginal folks who are denying climate change. I hope that we can really move past that at this point but really more importantly, it was a call from frontline communities, uh, the labor movement, uh, local economy leaders, uh, to really uh, put the issue of climate justice at the forefront of a broader economic justice agenda and connecting the issues of global capitalism and neoliberalism to the crises that we're seeing in economies and how it's playing out in our, in our local neighborhoods and communities. Um, I also wanted to connect the issue of what's happening in Ferguson uh, over the last uh, couple months um, I, I, I don't remember where I read this, but I saw a small quote recently that said that, um, you know, before the police and the criminal justice system failed Mike Brown and Ferguson, that the old economy uh, failed that community uh, before. And to recognize that economic justice, criminalization, uh, issues of um, uh, deportation and immigration, environmental justice are all connected <clears throat> and for us to see those things is connected through the economic system that we exist in. And so for me a lot of the uh, what I'm hoping for us to be able to talk about is to really highlight the work that is going on on the ground both through the cooperative development and the policy work and the research that both of you are doing uh, but also to help people understand how those uh, smaller models are helping to shift the logic of this dominant economic system. So we might not be talking about how we need to transform capitalism as a whole at this point, but I do think that the individual work that people are doing are changing relationships of people to governance, uh, democratizing workplaces, thinking about uh, the democratization of finance and capital, and these are all um, pivot points along the spectrum of capitalism that are sort of redefining and re-envisioning how we can relate to each other. Um, so that's sort of how I'm hoping we can approach it, and I know there's tons of great work that you're both doing that I'm sure everybody's really excited to hear about. So uh, with that, I would just wanted to first ask you all, since we're sort of talking about um, the global and the local, first to just have you, uh, maybe I'll start with you, Marnie, if that's all right, to share uh, where you're coming from and just generally sort of how you got to do the work that you're doing, and then sort of the next set is we'll, we'll talk more about the actual program and your organization specifically, but I'd love to just hear about kind of how you got to where you are and your general approach to this work. Sure. So I was, I was born in Cleveland, Ohio, um, and uh, 59 years ago or thereabouts, but I have been living in North Carolina for the last um, 42 years and I'm the mother of a born and bred southerner and a grandmother of a born and bred southerner so I think that sort of grandmothers me into being a southerner. A southerners, uh, not, not like, unlike lots of people around the, the country, they're slow to embrace the newcomer but I've been here a long time now and I, I think of myself as a southerner and being a southerner is a big part of why I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm building on the backs of lots of heroic southerners and I know that in some parts of the country the south is understood to be a place of deficiency and, and deficit and poverty and stupid ideas but I am mostly connected to wonderful people in the South and I know how much the South has to offer and I'm really eager to move the South because the South in many ways is the tail that wags the dog uh, of the United States in, in the political arena and I just want my home to be a better place too. So I live in Greensboro, North Carolina which is a city of about 300,000 people um, it's a pretty diverse population. Um, we have a long and storied progressive history here as well as a history of repression in Greensboro and I, when I moved here in the early 80s I got connected pretty quickly to that, the progressive community here and through that got connected to that history 
of civil rights activism around, well, the, the first sit-ins were at the Woolworths lunch counter here in Greensboro in 1960. And uh, in, in the 19s, by the end of the 60s, there was there were just years of rabble-rousing the streets that changed uh, all kinds of rules about what black folks could do in this city. Um, and by the late 70s, that we were marked by that other big event here, which was the 1979 massacre, where uh, five people were killed in the streets by a Klan and Nazi, and nobody went to jail for that murder. And that, that marked a whole lot of my activism after I moved here in 1982. Um, Again and again, uh, I, I met my colleague Ed Whitfield sometime in the 80s. We can't remember exactly when and where we met, but we were just constantly showing up at the same sorts of uh, economic justice, education justice, anti-racist sorts of events, and we became friends. And um, it's on this long-standing relationship of many, many years that we built much of the thinking that drives the Fund for Democratic Communities, which is where Ed and I are both located now. Um, there's a lot of poor folks in Greensboro, and a lot of folks in Greensboro don't want to talk, leaders in Greensboro don't want to talk about that, but we were recently given the not-so-great honor of being in the top ten of cities in the United States with the fastest-growing rates of poverty, uh, which has certainly caught the attention of the mayor here. Now they're having poverty summits, and I they're really horrible and stupid for the most part, I think. They are. Gosh, I hope the mayor's not listening to me say that. <laughs> favor from her shortly. But anyway, I mean, I think they're basically, I don't know, sociologists reciting statistics about poverty. And I, that's, they're not thinking about changing the economy, and you can't end poverty without changing the economy. It's very frustrating. Um, we are also tied for second in the United States as the second most food insecure place in the United States. We're tied with Bakersfield, California. And what that means to be most food insecure is that uh, in terms of percentage of people who answered the question, have you or someone you know gone to bed hungry in the last 30 days because you did not have food? And that we are tied for second in that honor. So that I'll be talking later about the, the grocery store project that we're working on, but you can see there's this tight connection between poverty and food that that is one of the angles that we're working here. Um, I think I've said enough and get the picture. There's lots of great people here and it's and we're struggling too. So that's great. Thanks, Marnie. Yep. All right. So that's a great uh, sort of way of really situating this conversation in some real communities. Um, and also to also as we go through this to celebrate the work and the people on the ground that you're working with, um, the community members who are putting in time and energy to really transform their own communities. It's very exciting. Uh, great. So Stacy, could I sort of ask you a similar question? Could you just tell us a little bit about uh, where you're from, how you identify uh, in that way, and sort of how that has impacted um, the amazing work that you're doing now? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, it's it's great to be in this conversation, and I so appreciate um, everything that you all do and and the coalition. It's been you know New Economy Week this year has really been. I mean, I've just been floored by the kind of caliber of the conversations that have been hosted and the essays. I haven't had a chance to read all of them yet, but so far the ones I've read have really been incredible. It is a body of, of conversation that they represent, the blog posts. It's, it's pretty remarkable, and so um, I just you know, want to thank Mike and everyone else who's been involved in, in organizing this week. I, um, I grew up in Maine, in Portland, Maine, and, um, and live here now. Um, Maine has um, and, and has had a very extractive economy. Um, you know, most of our economy historically has been based on resources, you know, timber, fish, uh, and really taking uh, wealth out of the state. You know, by large uh, outside companies, uh, very resource extractive. No real concern for the human communities here either. Um, Maine, uh, you know, has been a very poor state. It's often, you know, can be overlooked because I think if you visit here and you're, you know, in some of the coastal areas where there's some wealth and sort of summer tourism, it feels like one kind of economy. But much of the real economy of Maine is in the interior parts and far down east, uh, where the poverty rates are <clears throat> very similar. Excuse me, to what they are um, in, in Appalachia and other regions of the country that we really recognize. Um, as being very poor, but in different ways it seems to get a little bit uh, overlooked um, here, here in our state. Growing up here, um, you know, I just, there was a very strong, you know, feeling, um, I think, within our state and, and uh, 
that you know we were at the mercy of these outside forces, and that the best that we could do was sacrifice our natural resources, sacrifice our own lives for um, jobs, uh, you know, that were, that barely paid a living wage anyway. Um, and that was sort of the story of what the economy was about, and we were always dependent on somebody from away, some company that was maybe going to come in and do us a little bit of a favor, if you can call them a favor. Um, and that all of this was really beyond our control. So that's really, I mean, that was kind of my, how I understood the economy, you know, growing up. Um, and I graduated from high school in 1991, um, which was in the middle of that recession, the George Bush recession, which hit Maine really hard, and, and mainly because it really brought home how dependent we were on these outside forces, that things could happen away from us in the national economy, and we would just be you know, just be screwed by that. And um, it was very, very high unemployment and a lot of vacancies in our downtown here in Portland, and just pretty bad. Um, I left and went to college in Minnesota, um, and I studied um, labor and environmental history, um, U.S. history, um, mainly because I had this sort of, what I wanted to know was how does change happen? You know, how do things change? How do people change things? And it, I've always kind of, throughout my work, kind of relied on what I learned about the labor movement and the history for civil rights and the early environmental movement because things can and often do change quite dramatically in the short space of time based on what people do. And so I find that that's always a touchstone for me um, in, in um, you know, looking forward at, at the work now. I, um, I was very lucky not, not too long after college to um, find a job at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, which I had never heard of, um, but I you know, remember seeing the job opening and kind of looking on their website and being like, wow, this is really what I believe. This is an organization that is about how do communities build power, you know, economic power and political power. How do we think about building uh, an economy that's truly sustainable from every meaning of that word? Um, so I've been at the Institute now for about 16 years, and um, uh, in that time moved back to Maine and helped us open an office here. Um, so we're in Minneapolis, Maine, and Washington, D.C. So that's, that's my story. I like your story. We're waiting on Aaron. <laughs> I don't know if Aaron has frozen, so... It looks like he's frozen. Oh, dear. Okay. Well, this is Mike. While Aaron gets unfrozen, I just want to say, um, first of all, thank you again to both of you. Um, and also that uh, if folks watching want to engage in this conversation, uh, you can ask questions, uh, comment using the hashtag New Economy Week on Twitter, um, and if you are not on Twitter, you can send questions to me at mike at neweconomy.net, uh, and I will be able to relay those to Aaron and see if we can um, get those into the conversation. Um, Marnie, I'm wondering if, while we're waiting for Aaron to get unfrozen, if you can talk a little bit about uh, some of the work that F4DC is doing now, and particularly some of what you've been involved with with the Renaissance Community Co-op. Right. Sure. Um, I always love talking about the Renaissance Community Co-op. And I'll probably use the phrase, the, the word RCC, because it takes less time to say, but that's what I mean. The Renaissance Community Co-op uh, is a community-owned grocery store that is coming into life in Northeast Greensboro. Um, this is a part of Greensboro that's, um, I don't know, 90% African American, generally low income. Uh, they lost their last grocery store uh, in 1998 when a Winn-Dixie grocery store that had been operating in, uh, profitably, not particularly profitably, but it wasn't losing money, uh, it closed its doors in December of 1998 and it only gave a few weeks notice uh, about its intention to close. And the reason it closed had nothing to do with the prospects of future profitability for the store. It had to do with national grocery chain shenanigans, you know, the, the concerns of the CEOs of a national and international chain of grocery stores about where they wanted to invest and where they were going to disinvest. And this was part of a larger trend in the grocery industry that was happening all through the 90s and into the 2000s where they were walking away from communities where they were able to make money but weren't able to make a rate of profit that was satisfactory to the CEOs and to the shareholders. 
and that created a lot of food deserts in, in cities all over the country and lots of cities are facing this food desert problem. So uh, over the years this community of folks uh, actually the very first day that the word came that the Winn-Dixie was going to close, people got themselves organized and they were picketing the grocery store to try to get them to stay. And I've always wondered whether that was the greatest tactic in the world. I've never known a picket to get somebody to stay actually work. But it was the first thing they came up with. And um, at, at, out of that picket line arose the formation of a community group called uh, Concerned Citizens of Northeast Greensboro. And I think it's important to tell this story of the grocery store as going back all the way to that picket line um, because, because it's about people organizing themselves and understanding that they as individuals don't have that much power but collectively we have more power. I got invited into a meeting of Concerned Citizens of Northeast Greensboro sometime in January of 1999, just a month later. The grocery store was closed by then and the community started meeting and there were more than 100 people in a church that night trying to figure out what are we going to do about this grocery store situation. Um, and as you can see, it's now 2014 and there is not yet a grocery store there, but there is one that is well on its way. And so the, the first approaches that that group took didn't work. And the main, the main tenor of those approaches was to try to convince a chain retailer to come in and occupy the space that the Winn-Dixie had occupied. That didn't work for the same reason that the Winn-Dixie left. The rate of profit wasn't going to be sufficient to attract a chain retailer. And again and again they would almost have, a, they would be courting a grocer and the deal would fall through at the very end because basically the rate of return was insufficient. Meanwhile, everybody in Northeast Greensboro continued to eat. And I, I this is one of the myths that um, exists in this country about the food desert problem, which is that um, oh, well, there, there isn't enough money in these neighborhoods. One of the things you can count on, even in the poorest neighborhoods, is that people will continue to eat. If they don't, they die. It's really simple. Uh, so there is plenty of cash flowing through that neighborhood. If I, I'm not as smart as at it remembering numbers, but he has this great routine where he will recite to you the, the exact dollar value of the amount of money that's spent every week in the two-mile radius of that grocery store. And all I can tell you is it's it's more than 1.34 million dollars a week is being spent on food, and has at, at at this time that's a lot of money, and the community could probably do something with that money if it wasn't being extracted from the neighborhood, and that's sort of the theory behind the RCC. So in 2012, no grocery store had shown up, and uh, Ed and I had maintained connection with that community group, and we approached that group and said what do you think about a community-owned grocery store as a solution? And our motives in doing that were they, we wanted the community to have a grocery store, but we were also seeking uh, a way to demonstrate the power of cooperative ownership and its potential to solve a lot of economic problems. And we were initially told, don't worry about it, that's a nice idea, but don't worry about it because Save-A-Lot is coming. And again, by the late 2012, actually that was in late 2011, and by the end of that year, Save-A-Lot had pulled out. So in early 2012, the community leader said, yeah, we should talk about this. So by the summer of 2012, we had organized a couple of 15-passenger uh, vans to drive 30 people from the community, um, one town over, to have a look at a store called Company Shops Market, which was a relatively new uh, downtown community-owned grocery store in Burlington, North Carolina. And like many food co-ops, it's if you walk in the doors of company shops, it's a beautiful newer facility that's focused on natural and organic and local foods. And the price point isn't quite right and the foods that are being sold there aren't quite what the folks in Northeast Greensboro were looking for. But it really intrigued them when they saw this beautiful 10,000 square foot grocery store and met uh, the chairman of the board and met the, the store's manager and got a chance to talk to them for hours to ask every question they had. They came home from that trip and within a month or two they had voted, well I guess it was a couple of months because it was this coming Monday will be the second year anniversary of the official formation of the Renaissance Community Co-op Committee. Um, it took them a while to decide they were going to get educated and start raising the money and start this project. So that's the origin story for the Renaissance Community Co-op. Um, What's exciting about it is that co-ops are supposed to meet real community needs. Whoever owns the co-op, it's their needs we're trying to meet. This community is owning this grocery store. I think we're at like 298 members. It's, and, and this co-op is in many ways just like so many other food co-ops you may be familiar with. And in other ways, it is very different from other food co-ops. For one thing, it is not about organic and natural foods. It is about the kind of foods that you would find in a conventional grocery store like a Kroger. And this has actually ruffled some feathers in the food co-op 
uh, community because there's such a complete identification in some people's minds between food co-op and organic and natural. And we get pushback from folks outside of Northeast Greensboro who say, but don't poor people deserve healthy food too? Let me say a couple things about that. Of course everybody deserves healthy food, of course, except the price point on organic and natural, no matter where you're shopping for it, is way out of the ballpark for the commun this community. And the other thing I want to say is that right now, people are paying money to take taxis several miles to go to a grocery store, and that's cutting into their food buying dollar. Or they're walking across the street to one of two pretty run-down convenience stores where all, their buying choices include sodas, chips, beer, and wine, and cigarettes for the most part. So the range of food that's conventionally grown and packaged that is so much healthier than what is currently available. I mean, the, the health benefits of just having a regular grocery store in this community can't be can't be underestimated. There, there, were, there are going to be some organic and natural pro products on the shelves in this grocery store because this community says it wants some, but it doesn't want it to make up the bulk of what's on the shelves. And this is an important idea that the owners, the community owners of the grocery store are deciding what's going to be sold in the grocery store, not a larger food co-op movement that's focused on organic and natural. Um, what's exciting, I mean, as we were preparing for this panel, I, I think Mike sent an email around saying, hey, couldn't you send something you've written re recently? I don't get to write in English very much anymore, except I write business plans, and I do spend a lot of time looking at Excel spreadsheets with members of the community and other advisors on this project, because we're getting the lesson of our lives in how to build an enterprise that will be economically viable and, and owned by the community, and that means taking very seriously a lot of financial stuff and understanding cash flow balance sheets and, and all that stuff. That $1.34 million a week that gets spent on groceries, we have to capture 5% of that in order for our, our store to succeed. And if we do succeed, what it means for the community is really exciting. It means 31 jobs, 17 of which will be full-time, and all full-time positions will have access to benefits within a few months of starting work. Um, that is completely unheard of here in North Carolina in the grocery industry. The starting wage for the lowest paid worker will be $10 an hour. That is 33% more than the prevailing grocery wage here in Greensboro, North Carolina. Um, it's going to have 10,000 square feet of wonderful selections of food. It has to be professionally managed and run because not everybody has drunk the, the co-op Kool-Aid and so any customer coming in who has no particular affiliation with the sense of community ownership has to have a great experience in that grocery store, one that fulfills their sense of what a proper grocery store should have on its shelves and how the customers are treated and all that kind of stuff. So we need to, the, the, the co-op board will be hiring a, a gro an experienced grocery store manager to, who will be thinking about everything from how many SKUs can we put on the shelves to how am I going to schedule the labor so that I'm not that I'm optimizing everybody's time to get the most, uh, to, to meet everybody's needs in, as they come through the doors of the store. And there's a lot of technical stuff about running a grocery store, by the way, that I didn't know before we started this project, and I still don't know plenty of it. We rely wholeheartedly on a group called Uplift Solutions uh, in New Jersey, and they're a national nonprofit that works, their whole mission is to help get uh, full service grocery stores in urban food deserts. We are their very first. Um, client who is uh, using the co-op model and they are so excited about this because it solves a real dilemma for them. In other cities they have to rely on sort of entrepreneurial grocery families to decide to locate a grocery store in a neighborhood that has been without a grocery store for a while and there are sometimes conflicts of interest between the entrepreneurial interests of those grocery families and the people in the community and now in this case with the community owning its own grocery store uh, there's there's potential for a l less conflict and and more mutual help between the community and the grocery store. So Uplift is really excited about this project. Just to give people an idea of the financial scale of this project and why we put so much effort into it, like I said, it's 31 jobs. It's going to turn over about four million dollars a year in business in its opening years, and that and it's going to take about. Oh, one, depending on how you slice and dice the numbers, anywhere from 1.4 to 1.7 million dollars to open this store. And that's a lot more money than any of us usually ha are able to lay our hands on. And one of the things we've been learning about is how can we 
how can we accumulate that kind of capital and bring that kind of capital to bear in projects that are meant to serve the needs of poor folks and we're on our way uh, one of the biggest components of that uh, 1.7 million is the seven hundred thousand uh, dollar ask we are making of the city of Greensboro uh, the city council we hope will vote on this uh, once and for all next month six hundred thousand of that is a zero percent interest loan and a hundred thousand dollars we're asking for in a grant that we don't have to pay back the other sources of money for this project include a um, hundred thousand dollars in owner equity that works out to be about a thousand members at a hundred dollars a membership people in the neighborhood don't have much but uh, it, amazingly we've already sold almost three hundred memberships and there's nothing there's no store in place and yet people are so caught up with this that they are ponying up a hundred dollars some folks don't have a hundred dollars right now so they they buy it on a payment plan with twenty dollars down and ten dollars a month until they've paid all one hundred dollars um, there's another two hundred thousand that's coming in in the form of owner loans and we're about 51,000 of the way there. Um, a chunk of that is this is going to come from a lender, either a co-op, a lender that specializes in co-ops, North Country Co-op Development Fund, uh, or possibly another lender that specializes in food deserts. And it's great to have more than one lender interested in the project because we can play them off one against the other and get better terms. Um, let's see, other sources of money. There's some foundation money in it. Uh, some of that is our money, but there are two other foundations that are playing a little bit in this project, and we're very grateful for that. But I, I just one of the things that's important to understand in this enterprise and lots of them that are that we're working on through progressive lens is many of us, we, us progressives have been working inside of the nonprofit industrial complex for a long time, and people have a hard, so we're thinking foundations, we're thinking grant money, and in fact, the tax laws don't make it very easy for foundations to give grant money to for-profit enterprises. And this grocery store is intended to be for-profit. It is intended to not require constant infusions of cash from foundations. It is to operate on the strength of its own revenues and then preserve any profits for the use of the community. So it's not easy to move foundation money over to this uh, uh, kind of an enterprise. So we have to be more creative and it also makes sense to kind of start to detach from the nonprofit industrial complex because as useful as it can be for some things it's very very limiting and it's just a tiny corner of the big economy that's punishing us so much so we need my, it's my contention that we need to get real entrepreneurial and we need to start to build the new economy with serious projects that employ fair numbers of people and I, I, I love the mom-and-pop co-ops that I see growing up in other kinds of community-based businesses that are putting food on the table and shelters over people's heads I don't want to small business is great but I think the very small business isn't going to be enough to get us into the new economy we're going to have to start building enterprises that are 30 50 100 people at a clip in order to make a big impact in people's lives um, I think I've been talking a long time. I could say more about the Southern Grassroots Economies project now, but I think I'd rather just start hearing some more from Stacy about what she's doing, and I'll find a way to talk about SGEP later. Great. That was terrific, Marty. Um, well, I'll just, uh, Mike, unless you had anything to add at this point, I was just going to jump in. Um, yeah, that's, I was, I was going to segue, but go right ahead. Okay, I didn't know. We apparently have lost Aaron because Wait, of... I've got Aaron on the phone, and we were going to try to maybe speakerphone it. Aaron, are you there? Wait, let's try that. Aaron, are you there? Yep. Can you all hear him? I hear him. All right, we'll do it like this. Uh, I, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to hear. Okay, May maybe not then. Well, Stacy was just about to jump in anyway. Let's just have her do that. Um, well, th thanks, Marty. That was uh, really terrific to hear about. I guess um, I just have a couple of, of things that I, I thought I would put on the table before we sort of turn things over to kind of conversation and, and discussion and so on. Um, you know, I guess, you know, at, at ILSR, we, um, you know, our primary focus is doing research uh, on why we would be better off economically, socially, and environmentally if we had a more decentralized, locally controlled economy. Um, if we broke up some of these concentrations of power, what would that look like, you know, um, and what would that mean? And then second, doing a lot of the sort of nitty-gritty policy work, we spent a lot of time dealing with uh, you know, 
regulatory issues at the state and local level, um, you know, policy models, uh, and working with various kinds of, of grassroots groups um, to help them develop the kinds of things that they want to be going to their city council and their state legislators with to really forward what it is that they're trying to do in their communities. Um, in terms of just kind of a couple of like sort of broader points I want to make about, about the policy landscape, um, one is that I think it's really critical for all of us um, when, we, when we frame this and when we think about what the situation is, is to recognize and articulate that the current policy environment is rigged. You know, there are all kinds of ways in which state and local and federal policy really rigs the game. You know, we talk about having a free market, but there are all kinds of ways in which the biggest banks, the biggest retailers, the biggest agribusinesses get favors, handouts, rules written for them. Um, and so when we think about how do we change policy, it's not only thinking about what are the new ideas that we want to forward, but also having to recognize that the whole structure of policy that we're working in with right now is just tilting the playing field quite dramatically. And so a lot of what the work is in front of us is going through really systematically and looking at how those structures work. And I also think from a, from a rhetorical standpoint, it's really critical as we communicate with the new economy is all about publicly that we're um, really saying you know that this is this is a rigged game and um, and being really clear about that um, and, and because I think that changes how we think about the conversation and then the second kind of larger point I want to make is that um, well actually I'll just pause for a moment you know listening to Marnie's story about the, about this neighborhood that lacks a grocery store and sort of the larger problems of food deserts and so on made me think about ways in which policy, you know, has led to that very problem. Um, you know, I mean, there's been, uh, you know, in this time period that she described, in this time period that we've had this just enormous number of communities, both urban and rural, end up without food access, is a time where we've seen enormous square footage growth of grocery stores. You know, I mean, Walmart has built thousands of super centers of grocery stores, Kroger, all these big name brands. Um, we've seen about a tripling in the amount of retail space per capita in that time period. Um, but the problem is because of our land use laws, because of our transportation systems, we've actually incentivized in various ways this enormous amount of sprawl on the outskirts. And we've let these guys grow uh, into uh, uh, geographic areas where they're actually undercutting the ability of someone to have uh, a grocery store. In uh, you know in in a, in a historic neighborhood and in, in our town centers and all the places where we used to have grocery stores, and that corporate growth um, you know has been we've gotten this very consolidated grocery industry and we've we've directly subsidized it in a lot of cases you know during Walmart's heyday of its growth in movement into into the grocery business they were picking up public subsidies development subsidies from local governments on about one out of every three stores that they owned you know handouts of our tax dollars to facilitate that, often building in suburban locations and then undercutting the ability of independent grocers that have been serving uh, neighborhoods for a long time. You know, today there are 40 metro areas where Walmart has more than 50% of all grocery sales, half of the grocery sale market. So that's, you know, and that's been paid for with our tax dollars, it's been paid for with a host of, of planning and transportation policies that have enabled that. So food deserts really, in, in, in that sense, are a product of public policy. It's also been interesting to see the various policy responses to trying to solve that problem, which I think, again, really illustrate the ways in which we can use policy well or, or poorly. Um, a lot of the early, um, you know, a lot of the, the policy responses to date that states have taken up in cities, in some cases, to try to solve the food desert problem have been, um, let's give tax breaks to, let's give tax breaks. If you locate a grocery store in this neighborhood, we'll give you a tax break. The problem with that model is that the only people who can take advantage of a tax break are big companies that have money, you know, that have profits to write off where they need a tax break. Um, big companies don't want to be in those neighborhoods. They don't need a tax break. That's not the reason that they're not going there. They have plenty of capital to expand. They just don't want to be in those communities. The places where we've seen some exceptions, it's really interesting. Pennsylvania has this program, the Fresh Food Financing Initiative, where instead of doing tax breaks, they said, we need to do loans and small business assistance. And they've now built uh, about 100 grocery stores, some co-op, some small business, variety of different kinds of uh, businesses, but 100 of them that have been, come into being in 
uh, low-income, underserved, uh, both rural and urban neighborhoods. And it was a shift in the thinking about how policy ought to work, where it said, you know, what we need is local ownership, and we need solutions that facilitate ownership. So I think there's just a lot of ways in which, you know, how we think about public policy um, is just absolutely critical um, to, to what it is that we can achieve. Um, one of the things that Mike uh, you know, asked you know, sort of in his questions uh, to, to think about for today was sort of where are the big areas um, that we see real policy opportunities. Um, and I, I think there's a tremendous amount that we can do at the state and local level. And I think one of our opportunities, you know, I, I think generally Americans are very focused on the federal government and Congress and this sort of thing. And, and for, for good reason in, in some, some respects, but I think we in the process overlook the enormous amount of power that, that city governments have, for example, and that state governments have. Uh, and I think one of our opportunities as a movement is to really think about how do we harness those opportunities and what are the, the kinds of policies that we can move at that level. So, uh, you know, when we look out onto the landscape, some of the things that we think are really interesting opportunities right now, um, one is, uh, and I'll, I'll give you, I think, three or maybe four, I don't want to run out of time here, but um, uh, one is the, the opportunity to use um, uh, all, of the, all of the government spending footprint. So government purchasing, um, uh, government infrastructure, all the ways that local and state governments spend money and the kinds of things that they spend money on. I think there are tremendous opportunities there to think about um, how do we inject a set of values um, and goals within those spending choices so that we're redirecting those funds in ways that support um, the kinds of economic models that we want to see and that make public purchasing and public infrastructure investments a tool for modeling the kinds of high road uh, environmentally sustainable economic models that we want to see throughout the economy and really a big tool for, for beginning to accelerate those kinds of shifts uh, in, in how the economy operates. I also think that there's some significant opportunities um, for you know, very particular areas. Uh, so for example, we have a, a community broadband initiative. Um, we're doing a lot of work with cities um, who are uh, building their own uh, fiber infrastructure and creating their own um, ways to offer internet, ca cable, television, uh, and phone service to to their um, citizens at much lower cost than people pay in cities where the only choice is Time Warner or Comcast. And those networks have been incredibly uh, effective and are growing in the places, uh, growing in a lot of different cities. Um, and there's now a new coalition of mayors that's actually going to announce itself next week, which is a group that's saying, you know, cities really need to take over this market and it shouldn't be controlled by corporations. And so it's not only a critical piece of infrastructure that's now being taken over with and, and infused with these public values and saving money and, and, and broadening access, but it's also beginning to model the idea that we can collectively own pieces of our infrastructure and the public is a good thing. We've been uh, you know, on this sort of privatize everything kind of model and this is a really great uh, example of where the private model is disastrous and has been so badly serving us and here's a great example of how cities can really take that back. Um, the other area, one of the other areas that we really see big opportunities right now are in the energy sector. Um, as many people probably know, um, the financial, uh, 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 you know, sort of the bottom line with the cost of putting rooftop solar panels on your, on your house um, has changed dramatically even in just the last few years. And so there are a growing number of states now that are reaching what's called grid parity, meaning that you can put solar on your house um, or join in a cooperative neighborhood solar uh, array that is collectively owned, uh, and, and uh, you know, and, and 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 finance that for less than what it will cost for you to buy your power from the local utility. Mm -hmm. So the dynamics are really shifting. There's some states where that's already true, and we're predicting in the next few years there's going to be a lot more states where that's true. How the rules are written and what the uh, financing mechanisms that are put in place, because there's obviously an upfront cost to installing solar, um, are going to make a lot of difference in the next few years as to how much uh, community and local ownership of the energy generating infrastructure we can 
create in this country. States that are out ahead with the right set of rules, cities that are out ahead with the right set of rules, um, really have an enormous opportunity to revolutionize how power is produced, not only in a way that makes it more environmentally sustainable, but in a way that enables all of us to own a piece of that power generation uh, and just change the economic dynamics of a whole industry. So that's a huge area where we're doing a lot of work both at the city level uh, and at the state level. And then the last one I'll just mention is I think that there's um, there are huge opportunities to look at land use and economic development policy. I think we just generally tend to overlook um, planning and zoning. <laughs> um, it sort of seems like this arcane thing and it's a bit dry and all this sort of thing, but it is an area in which when you really look at it, um, your local government has an extraordinary amount of power over what companies can do in your community. Um, and our land use policies have a lot to do with you know, what the, the kinds of policies we've had in place with you know, which neighborhoods get bypassed, you know, wh where are communities kind of locked out of opportunities, has a lot to do with things like our carbon footprint, since driving is such a huge amount of our greenhouse gases, um, and, and it also has a lot to do with the kinds of <clears throat> businesses that can take root, you know, cities that, ha that use their land use policy to create the right kind of um, habitat for local entrepreneurs, uh, for small-scale cooperative kinds of businesses, um, or not, you know, I mean, that's, that, that, that's the power that cities really have to shape um, uh, uh, their business landscape. So I spend a lot of time working with communities on, on taking advantage of those policies, um, not only reforming them in ways that support more sustainable, walkable neighborhoods that create the kinds of uh, civic and community infrastructure that enables people to come together and to develop and grow uh, a local economy, um, but also thinking about how can we use these tools to um, uh, change the power dynamics between communities and big companies. And one of the ways we can do that is that we can control um, at the local level who gets to develop and under what circumstance in our communities. And we've um, used zoning policy in a, in a, in, in a, a couple of, uh, a few cities and in, in one state to really say, you know, if you want to build here, there's going to be an economic um, uh, threshold that you have to pass. You know, there's going to be a community impact threshold that you have to pass. Basically giving communities a lot more leverage um, with regard to developers and with regard to incoming companies to say, you know, what you're offering isn't good enough and we're just going to say, no, you can't just develop here unless you come back with something that really uh, meets these kinds of economic, environmental, and community standards. So I see a lot of opportunity to really continue to develop policies that, that use this huge power that cities have in terms of planning and zoning, and I think that's a big opportunity going forward. Um, so those are my thoughts. I'll, I'll leave it there and, and turn things back over. Mike, is that Mike or, or Aaron? It's Mike. Aaron, uh, his internet connection cogged out because we're doing a Google Hangout on air. He can't rejoin the call while we're broadcasting. Um, I'm trying to figure out a workaround if I can like screen share a Skype call or if you can just feed me questions or something like that. Um, in the meantime, though, I'm, I, I heard a lot of uh, overlap in what the two of you were saying, and I heard a lot of things that seemed like they were sort of cross-applicable. So I'm wondering, um, Marty, if there's anything you want to respond to or if there's things that Stacy said about the, the policy landscape that are resonant with your experience in Greensboro. Yeah, no, Stacy, I would love to, after we finish this, we should just exchange contact information because I think there's some guidance you could maybe give us about our current ask to the city and how to manage some of that. Yeah. Um, a couple things I want to say, um, Stacy. Your description of growing up in Maine as an extractive economy, I'm, my partner is from Western Australia whose motto is dig it up and ship it out. And I, I mean, that's where I have my sense of what, if Maine is anything like that, I get what you mean about the economy of the area are just being stripped out and the people aren't being treated very well either. Um, I guess. We are about to approach the city of Greensboro. We, we have been approaching the city of Greensboro for over two years to play its part in this important project. And so a lot of what you were just talking about, using existing uh, policies about land use and economic development, is where we have been playing. And it's been, a, it's been interesting 
we have our allies for sure in elected positions, positions and in staff positions with the city and I'm very hopeful we're going to achieve our goal of getting significant funding from the city for this project but it is an uphill battle because of things people won't even articulate honestly with us sometimes I mean there's a there's we're starting to hear it well actually we can't give you that all that money because frankly we're not sure black folks can do that um, is starting to be whispered around N nobody will ever say that officially but I just want to bring this the specter of race and class into this to see you know how it is playing out in this policy framework um, where the number the amount of money we're asking for from the city is completely consistent with um, the, the economic incentives given to other companies in terms of the number of jobs created and yet we're getting all this resistance and they, I, there is one factor that I think we have to be honest about in our ask that is a weakness I suppose which is we are a startup we are not Procter and Gamble looking for incentives to add jobs to an already existing big big facility that's already here so that we aren't a, it's not a fair comparison in that way but we're right in the ballpark and I've seen them give incentives to some other uh, startups and so it's been really interesting to, 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 be, to be seeking these incentives in an environment where there's just so much doubt about whether the co-op model will work, whether, whether a poor community is capable of governing a co-op and I, I, we've been doing a lot of education on the difference between store management and governance of the co-op, they're two different things and we're also doing a lot of education of the RCC community so that its board of directors and the community at large understand their role in terms of governance and all that's got to be taken really, really seriously. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I mean, I can. We, I'm right up in the middle of these very policy, local policy fights that you're talking about, Stacy. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you know a lot about them. I'll be talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm really, and I'm really, I'm, I'm really fascinated by, by your story and sort of, you know, I think part of the way that, <clears throat> part of what ILSR has been able to do um, well, or what what gives us a lot of our. Um, Strength is that we, you know, we learn from the grassroots groups that we work with, and they often take the stuff that we, you know, maybe have developed, and they refine it and develop it even further, and then we share that out with other communities. And so I always feel like we're we're sort of like just this middleman as a conduit between people who are really doing this work and thinking about it on the ground. I mean, I think what you're, you know, part of what you're um, articulating is just so true in the sense that. Um, I feel like we spend a lot of our time documenting, you know, uh, and reporting on how um, these uh, new economic models or, or even you know, existing uh, economic models uh, that are part of a new economy um, are as good or superior and as effective and as uh, long-lasting and, and all the rest of it as the corporate model, you know. And we, you know, we face an uphill battle because the, the dominant conventional thinking, you know, is that giving money to some big company to add jobs or whatever is somehow going to be a better deal in the long run. And yet when you really start looking more deeply in, in, um, you know, across these things, what you see is that the number of, of big companies that take those dollars and then close up move out of town, you know, all, you know, there, there are no guarantees and in fact a lot of communities are much worse off for having gone that route and so part of what we see as our role is always, you know, is taking, uh, is doing that real documentation, that side to side comparison um, of, of what success means. Um, I've been working, you know, uh, this week on, on an analysis that we're going to put out next week about an unusual law in North Dakota that requires that pharmacies be owned by locally, owned, be owned locally. So there are no chain pharmacies in North Dakota. Walmart doesn't have any pharmacies in its stores. There are no Walgreens and, and the like. It's all independents. And what's fascinating is that North Dakota beats pretty much all the other states on just about every measure of pharmacy uh, care. They have the, among the lowest prices, the best quality. They have more pharmacies per capita than any other state. Pharmacies are in much smaller communities. Uh, higher quality care and all the way down the line and it's a really you know it's this kind of microcosm case study of the fact that you know what when we do things on a local scale it doesn't mean that it's inferior you know and that that idea is really um, very uh, very much outdated and I think that we've got to you know, sort of up our game and being able to document that to city officials but I also think you're right it's it's um, it's uh, you know it's underpinned by these sort of deeply held 
beliefs that aren't necessarily rational. Um, and then you, you add on to that, um, you know, uh, discrimination um, and attitudes about race and so on and about poor people. Um, and it, it is really challenging to say that the kind of economic models that we're forwarding are absolutely legitimate and are very much worthy of the same kind of support and, in fact, should be getting that support instead of, you know, the bigger companies. Yeah. Um, I also saw um, some threads on the issue of scaling the new economy and what you were talking about. And I've been, I was asked about this earlier in the week in a different context, and I just wanted to give a little bit of, a little more history on the RCC project and then talk about how that project relates to our notions about scaling and I, I want to say right away that scaling is daunting and I, I do not think that we at F4DC have finished our thinking about this and that our NEC world has not finished its thinking about scaling and we have to take scaling really seriously but here's some beginning thoughts that we're having about it. Um, I think that scaling won't happen unless things are really really organically rooted and so you can't skip that organically rooting it in a place part if you're going to ever get to scale. Um, and because a lot of people want to talk to me about, well, this is never going to scale up. I'm like, are you in a place? How would you know? You know. And so I, I just think that's something we can't overlook. And a, and a piece of the RCC story that's really important to its, I think, success is that after that group, Concerned Citizens for Northeast Greensboro, formed to try to get a grocery store there. It, ha it took a little diversion in the middle part of the 2000s. It spent years fighting the reopening of a landfill that had been closed down in the 90s. This is a landfill that is about a mile away from the site of the grocery store and the odors and, and public health issues around that landfill being opened in a densely populated area were huge. And so people organized to get that landfill closed in the 90s and then in the 2000s, a, a different city council came to took office in Greensboro, and they their solution to some trash issues we were having was to suggest the reopening of that landfill. And it, so, concerned citizens for Northeast Greensboro organized itself even better in order to fight that landfill. And I actually was kind of a cynic about it. I thought, oh, it, that's a done deal. That that landfill is going to be reopened. I didn't see the politics of this working any other way, and I was wrong. And the persistence and the organization of that community was really impressive. And now White Street Landfill is good and closed and will be staying closed. And it's important because it was in defeating the reopening of the landfill that that community got itself like chuffed up enough to say, oh, now, now let's take this grocery store issue on in an even more serious way. And I, I just want to say that that sort of history of political struggle, it isn't always about building the new economy. It isn't always, um, it's, it's often about resisting something from the old economy is how you learn that you have community and that you can do things together better than you can do on your own. And that speaks to this idea, an idea we use a lot at F4DC, which is, we abbreviate it as RAD, R-A-D. It stands for R for resistance, A for advocacy, and D for do for ourselves. And in the progressive movement, we have been, become pretty skilled at resistance and there's all these classic resistance tactics and there's newer resistance tactics that are coming on right now um, and and in the case of the RCC story the res acts of resistance was they were resisting the reopening of that landfill and it was through that act of resistance that they learned a lot of stuff that they're putting to work now in building a grocery store and right now we are in an advocacy stage of the grocery store project where we are advocating to get our $700,000 in, in city investment to add to the pool of other financing for the grocery store. And in both the case of resistance and advocacy, you are working, you are assuming power is outside of you. And Stacey, I remember you said in your introduction that you are all about helping, asking the question, how do communities build power? And the, the thing is, is understanding that the power is in us, not always outside of us. Yes, there are centers of power outside of us, who can do us harm, in which case you must resist them, or they can do us good, in which case you must advocate for them to do the right thing with that power. But the other thing that doesn't get enough attention is how much power we have for ourselves. And when we understand ourselves working together to be the power, we can do for ourselves amazing things. And that's, so the grocery store coming into being is, is, will be an, uh, an example of doing for ourselves writ large. Um, and so this whole project of the grocery store is all, all along this continuum of re resist, advocate, and do for ourselves. 
So I, relating that to scaling, I think you're going to be working in all three of those areas as we move towards scale. We view the grocery store itself as a gateway drug for community ownership. And once it, when the store opens, there will be more than a thousand people in Northeast Greensboro who are owners of their own store. And they will understand what cooperative governance means and what community ownership means. And once they have a taste for that, that's when we can come in and start talking about the next kind of community ownership project, which is maybe it's going to be a worker-owned co-op that is based around meeting the procurement needs of the city of Greensboro or one of the hospitals or universities in Greensboro. I don't know. But we, we, we think people need existence proofs before they can go big. And um, before we can talk scale, we just need to have a, a sort of a network of existence proofs proving that people can't, that the community can own stuff and properly take care of stuff. And so there are more and more of those existence proofs around the country. I'm just pretty well focused on getting existence proofs here in the south of the U.S. right now. Um, so that's what I wanted to say about scale, that it starts with existence proofs and that those need to be networked together. And then from that, we can, we can now talk about scale. I guess the last thing I want to say about scale is capital. We need capital to go to scale. And it's, I, I, if Aaron were on this call right now, I think I'd be picking his brains about what he's thinking about capital because I know he spends a lot of time thinking about it. Um, so I, the Southern Grassroots Economies Project is trying to grapple with the need for capital in the South for building a new economy. And we're just starting to put together ideas for the evolving long term. Um, I'll shut up now. Um, interesting question. I don't know if y'all have the answer, um, but coming in over Twitter, um, someone asks, are you aware of any co-op developers on workforce investment boards in any cities? I guess, what, or taking that question broader, um, where does this work intersect with electoral work? Um, where are we seeing anywhere, um, you know, getting uh, getting folks to the kinds of local bodies, and we have Aaron back somehow. Renee, our tech guy, has worked a miracle. Um, but let's let's take that question off Twitter, and then uh, Aaron, you can uh, take us home for the last fifteen minutes of this. Stacy, I bet you know more about that than I do. My answer is no, I don't. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, there's sort of two parts with that question. You know, I think that we do need to do a kind of systematic look at um, the economic development resources that are out there uh, and entities that are out there and the ways in, in which those uh, funds and then that, that kind of sub technical support can be redirected. Um, you know, it's interesting to think about workforce development. I, I hadn't before, but to think about workforce development uh, entities um, having a, a cooperative focus, um, or at least a, a plank of what they're doing um, could be around helping people develop co-ops or helping businesses transition to cooperative ownership. Um, I've also, uh, one of the things that I've been thinking about, I do a lot of work with small businesses, um, and I uh, spend a lot of time looking at you know, different kinds of things like the Small Business Administration, uh, which does has a, a loan guarantee program to help uh, you know, to help finance small businesses that are just outside of being able to get a conventional bank loan. And the loans are made by banks, but then they're, they're guaranteed uh, by the federal government. And in the scheme of business loans, it's, it's not huge. It's a fairly small percentage of all the business lending in the country, but traditionally has played a disproportionate share in business lending to businesses owned by minorities, businesses owned by women, very small businesses, um, startups, and the like. And so, um, although it's small compared to all small business lending, it's very pivotal in some of the key um, business lending areas. Um, it occurs to me, you know, sort of looking at what they do, um, I, it was surprising in some ways, and I guess not in others, to learn that you realize that they don't have any um, technical assistance or other support program. Um, around cooperatives, and there are two really critical ways for independent businesses to be uh, engaged in cooperatives. One is succession planning, so when the owner uh, wants to retire, um, you know, being able uh, to have the option of selling to their employees and to be able to have support and, and resources and technical assistance on how to do that is 
would be a very good use, in my opinion, of, of, of public uh, resources. And then the second is that, um, you know, independent businesses in sectors where there are uh, wholesale cooperatives, distribution cooperatives that are collectively owned um, by all the small businesses. Uh, we see this in some in the grocery sector, some in the hardware sector, some in other sectors. Those businesses are much uh, healthier and better off, and we've been able to maintain a larger share of the market in those segments because of those um, cooperative networks um, that, that they own. Uh, and again, uh, you know, there are no resources, SBA or otherwise, for um, supporting the development of wholesale cooperatives. Um, and I think that would be a great uh, in, you know, investment. And we can begin to think about you know, cooperatives of cooperatives, and how do we build these larger institutional uh, cooperatives at these sort of higher levels of the supply chain that in turn enable the smaller local cooperatives to get going. Um, I think that's really critical and something that we should be looking at. On the electoral piece, you know, absolutely. I mean, I think, um, you know, we're thinking more about um, engaging networks of local elected officials and beginning to build sort of caucuses around certain issue, you know, issue areas from a kind of new economy or local self-reliance perspective. Um, but I think that's really going to be critical going forward and that we need to figure out how to, um, to really target and engage in the context of elections a conversation around this set of issues that we need to kind of move out of this, this from standard liberal conservative conversation and inject a different idea about the economy uh, into that. And then also we need to figure out how to, how to you know, have a pipeline of candidates who speak to our values. And as I said at the very beginning, I think there's so much opportunity policy-wise at the local and state level. Um, you know, that, that's where a lot of our focus um, should be. Stacey, are you aware of local progress? Yes. Yeah. I, I have to say that I, I this we're in election time. We're in an even-numbered year, and it's election time, and I feel I can hardly wait until it's over. Let me just say that. Um, I'm not enthused about my options, and I have a hard time exactly seeing how the outcome will make much difference in the work that most concerns us. But in the odd-numbered years, we have our municipal elections, and they are still nonpartisan, although there is a move in our state legislature to force them to become partisan and tied to the even-numbered kind of party politics kind of thing. But anyway, I mean, do you have any stories from local progress and its engagement in, uh, in the kinds of issues that we care about? You know, I don't know of any offhand, but I haven't I haven't looked too closely. Um, I mean, just to, for people who aren't familiar with them, but it's a network of mayors and is it also city council people? I think it's largely city council. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, it's a it's a new thing that started just in the last year or two, um, you know, and has been has been growing. Um, uh, you know, and I think that's exactly the kind of model that we have to build, you know, more relationships um, with. Yeah. Great. So uh, I'm just going to jump back in. So uh, nice to have you back, Aaron. Yeah, Aaron. I'm sorry about that. I was watching you guys on YouTube, uh, <laughs> being a fan that I am of both of you. But um, I didn't get to hear sort of everything that was going on. But I thought one, one way that uh, – one thing that would be great just to hear, maybe as we start to wrap up, is you all have had a chance to talk about some of the work you're doing directly. And um, it's just incredibly inspiring and um, – very exciting. And part of what I wanted to hear was, are there other uh, localities, other cities or towns that you all have engaged with that have been particularly inspiring? I think part of this conversation is to help raise up the work that's happening in our own communities and then to sort of, as we recognize that this is, in a lot of ways, as we've talked about, the new economy is not new uh, and is really based on um, ancient approaches in many ways. But at the same time, we do know that we need to take these things that are happening in the localities uh, help bring them together in singular places and then grow them, scale, as you are talking about. But um, So yeah, could you guys just shout out maybe um, what is really exciting and inspiring for you in other places uh, in your states or, or in the country that you'll have seen? Go ahead, Stacy. Well, you know, I do, um, I, I, as I mentioned, do a lot of work with independent businesses and I've been really excited by the growth of the Independent Business Alliance movement, which 
now is about 150 cities and about 50,000 uh, local business owners that are members of those organizations. And there's some places where, you know, sometimes surprising places where they're really changing the conversation. And Arizona is one that comes to mind, Phoenix of all places. Um, there's a local business alliance there, Arizona Local First, that is actually you know, managing to change uh, land use policy and to make the city much more focused on uh, adaptive reuse of historic buildings, on things like walkability, I mean, stuff that is pretty far out for a city like Phoenix. Um, and a lot of that's come because, because there's this sort of local business community that's, that's changing the way that that conversation is happening at that city government level. And they've done some very interesting things. They've outlawed um, development subsidies for big retailers at the state level. That's a policy that, that's come out of, of them. Um, and I think sort of illustrating, I think one of the, the reasons I, I thought of Arizona, you know, uh, as something to mention is that um, really illustrating that if we, uh, you know, that, that, that there's an opportunity here to change the political dynamics, because I think that there's, a, I think there's a huge constituency out there that understands that our economy is broken, and that if we can articulate a different way forward, um, we can do that in regions of the country that are not, you know, typically progressive, um, and that that that's, you know, really part of the the exciting strategy here. Um, other places, um, we've been doing work for the last couple of years in Minneapolis with a campaign, campaign called Minneapolis Energy Options, um, which uh, you know, was a group of citizens who came together and found uh, this sort of regulatory uh, opportunity in the renewal of the utility's ability to use public rights of way. Um, to, you know, they run their, their lines and so on, and uh, when that came up for renewal, they said, you know what, we really need a different kind of renewable energy standard, we need different ways for local people to tap into the grid, and, and now we have this, um, you know, this ability to use the, the fact that you need to get this renewed um, to insert a public community voice in there, and so that's been kind of an interesting and exciting thing to be uh, part of, and something that will, you know, I think will get, uh, uh, you know, create a model for a lot of other cities uh, to, to employ. So those are just two that kind of come to mind right off uh, the top of my head. That's great. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, um, how about you, Marnie? I'm pretty recently back from Coopicon 2014, which is the annual uh, training institute that happens uh, sponsored by the Southern Grassroots Economies Project in Epps, Alabama. And I, I mean, I just came home high as a kite, and I'm still high even though it's two or three weeks back now. So just a few things. At this thing, the Florida Dream Defenders got together with the Florida Farm Workers Association. Do I know what they're going to get up to? No, but they got <laughs> together. And I'm really excited to see what happens next with these two really interesting social justice focused groups now also incorporating this do for ourselves cooperative stuff into their thinking. I'm really excited about, about that. We talked. I talked to the Dream Defenders about grocery stores in Liberty City in, in Miami, and I talked to them also about a taxi co-op as a possibility, and I've been talking for a while with the Florida Farm Workers Association about they, uh, basically a farm worker owned worker co-op instead of being brokered out by these other guys. I mean, there's some really exciting things that could be happening there, and I'm convinced that this, the networking of groups like the Dream Defenders, the young and vibrant feisty dream defenders getting together with the farm workers who you know just have years and years of experience of fighting for worker rights in in and in, in the growing of our food that's very cool to me um, other groups and places I mean we spend a lot of time thinking with the folks and in cooperation Jackson uh, in Jackson Mississippi and you know they're they're in a difficult time to be sure since the death of Chokwe Lumumba the um, who was part of the Malcolm X grassroots movement mm -hmm. and got elected to be mayor of the city of Jackson and when uh, Chokwe died in February quite unexpectedly uh, and was replaced by a, a different kind of mayor I'll just say. Um, many of the opportunities that we were working on are not going to be immediately possible anymore but it's really impressive to see the way the dream of community ownership uh, and a new economy for Jackson that is just and sustainable and democratic is not been let go and those guys are still working really hard on a couple different ideas uh, in Jackson. Um, our partners in the Southern Grassroots Economies Project, other partners we work closely with are of course the Federation of Southern Co-ops and 
I mean, we just feel so honored to be part of their long history of bringing civil rights together with the co-op movement. That's They're always up to great stuff. And bizarrely, one of the places they're working right now is Cleveland, Ohio, my birthplace. And I don't know what the Federation of Southern Co-ops is doing up in Ohio is interesting. They're teaching urban people how to build hoop houses, and they know a lot about hoop houses. Um, so that's exciting to me that there's that cross-fertilization going on. So those are just some of the things that got me excited. Oh, I talked to a group out of uh, a little bit east of us in North Carolina uh, who are starting a, a nursery co-op growing, I don't, by which I don't mean babies, I mean small trees. Um, and I, it's just great. I, I like sitting down with folks and saying, oh, let's do a preliminary uh, Performa and see whether the numbers make any sense at all and people are just so ready for this stuff and I'm just so pleased to see people occupying the economy you know they're not people are not ceding economic stuff over just to big business anymore they're saying I want that for me and my community amazing all right great well um, uh, I'm thoroughly inspired and really appreciate the work that both of you are doing and for you to be sharing this with uh, the whole country and the, the amazing network at the New Economy Coalition that we have. It's just been fantastic. Um, I just thought I would leave us, uh, we're going to wrap up now. Uh, we've had our hour and 15, although I haven't gotten to enjoy the whole thing of it. Um, but one of my mentors, um, Canon Ed Rodman, just uh, you were talking about Greensboro and he was one of the high school students who were in that Hi. first uh, lunch counter sit-in and he, he has worked with people like Dr. King and Malcolm X throughout the years and has been an incredible mentor to me. One of the biggest quotes that he shared uh, with me has always been this very basic idea. He says that we need to have uh, movement-centered leaders, not leader-centered movements. Mm -hmm. And when you're talking about the, uh, the, the work that's happening just in the Dream Defenders and all over the country, really, what, what I think is really exciting about this particular moment in time is that it seems like we have a multitude of strategies and um, organizing work and finance and business sort of across the spectrum that um, the Economy Coalition and other groups like Bali and folks that I've been working with are, are really helping to sort of coalesce into a broader movement. But what's really exciting is that it seems like people are doing and experimenting with this work on the ground in their own communities uh, in their own particular way. And I think that in a lot of ways uh, for us to be thinking about the building of the movement that's much broader. Um, that isn't sort of based around individual charismatic leadership, but is about people taking their own uh, communities and, and taking control of, over what's happening in their economies is, is how this work is going to move forward. So uh, I just thank uh, both of you uh, for helping highlight and illuminate some of this incredible work and also just want to shout out uh, folks at the New Economy Coalition for um, hosting New Economy Week and bringing uh, this conversation forward. I think with the that, New Economy Coalition. Uh, we're going to wrap up. Yeah, thank you. It's been great. All right. Thank you all thank you so all. much. And there's still, there's still a little bit of New Economy Week left over the weekend. Uh, there's a